Okay, um, let's get started for the second and final session of the seminar on dams and displacement. I hope the first session was interesting in terms of getting a rare insight into, on one hand, how planning for project works, how lessons are learned over time, and there's a cost involved in learning, but how it gets implemented over time. The second session is going to look at totally different aspects of displacement. It will be in terms of how the displacement is seen from the affected people's point of view and what are its impact over generations. And the third thing will be why some projects of resettlement are more successful as opposed to others. So the first speaker for the second session is Joy Bilhars. Joy is professor of anthropology and at the uh, Department of Sociology and Anthropology, State University of New York College at Fredonia. Joy received her PhD in anthropology from Bryn Mawr College. Her research interests include involuntary resettlement sex and gender, and Iroquoian studies. She began research on the Senecas while a member of the faculty at the Murkyhurst College, Pennsylvania, before moving on to SUNY, SUNY College at Fredonia on the southern shore of Lake Erie, approximately midway between Erie, Pennsylvania, and Buffalo. She is the author of the book, The Allegheny Senecas and the Kinzua Dam, and most recently, Oriskany, A Place of Great Sadness, a Mohawk Valley Battlefield Ethnography. Jo will be presenting her paper. The title reads, It's Still Our Home, It's Just That We Don't Live Here Anymore, unquote. The forced relocation of Allegheny Senecas due to the Kinzua Dam in Pennsylvania. Over to Joy. Thank you. I move it as if I can yeah. do that. Okay, if you can just. Okay. okay, I'd like to thank um, Vikram for inviting me to, and to, to participate in this symposium. Um, and I'm going to talk about um, the removal of nearly 700 Senecas uh, from the Allegheny Reservation of the Seneca Nation of Indians. and. It's not moving. No, oh, okay. Um, and the quote, the, it's still our home, but we don't live here anymore, came from the late Deuce Bowen. This is a very typical picture of Deuce um, talking to, to a young woman, talking about the old ways and the impact of, of, of removal on him. He was a, an adolescent at the time. Sorry, I'm just not good at this kind of stuff. Um, so the Seneca Nation was founded in 1848 following the withdrawal of the Senecas from the Iroquois Confederacy. And the, the Seneca Nation consists of three reservations. So I'm going to be talking about the Allegheny River right here. So the, the Allegheny follows on about half a mile on each side of the Allegheny River. Um, the Cataraugus Reservation is on Cataraugus Creek flowing into Lake Erie. There's also a mile square oil spring reserve. Um, this is not occupied. It's, it's the site of a historic um, oil spring that the Senecas used. The other thing I'll be talking about briefly or mentioning is the Corn Planter Grant. This is land uh, just across the line in Pennsylvania. This was land that was given in the late 18th century to Chief Corn Planter, who was a Seneca chief, and to be held by his, by his heirs. And this land is also going to be flooded. Um, Kinzua Dam is down here, and the flood pool goes well into the Allegheny Reservation, as, as you'll see. Um, the government here consists of an executive branch that, that's comprised of a treasurer, a uh, president, and a clerk. 
and there's a, they're elected every two years, and there's also 16-person council that's elected to four-year staggered terms. By tradition, the president and the treasurer come from different reserves. So if the president's from Cattaraugus, the treasurer is going to be from Allegheny, and the treasurer is the de facto head of that reservation. Because the presidency shifts every two years, what this means is that the, the government can become unstable if you're seeing a totally different group of people coming in every two years. Now, although prehistorically the Senecas relocated their villages every 12 to 20 years, the primary impact on them was physical, and the major institutions of social life remained unchanged. But such was not the case with the relocation caused by the construction of Kinsua Dam in Warren, Pennsylvania in the early 1960s. The dislocation that was suffered by the Senecas um, differed significantly from previous movements because it took place within the context of post-World War II society, the industrial expansion, and reflected the needs of a capitalist society in which the Indians represented a distinct and often overlooked minority. The idea of a dam on the Upper Allegheny River dates from 1908, uh, when the Pittsburgh Chamber of Commerce organized the Flood Commission of Pittsburgh, uh, and it recommended a series of res reservoirs to control flooding and to promote industrial growth. That H.J. Hines headed the commission strongly suggests that, the, that industrial concerns were preeminent. A dam would benefit them by keeping the water level high and thereby reducing the sulfurous drainage that was coming from the coal mines and causing the boilers to rust out in Pittsburgh, particularly the boilers and the steel mills. Thirty years later, in hearings about Kinzua, uh, Congressman James Haley um, from Florida stated, quote, this construction of the Kinzua Dam was primarily to flush out the Allegheny River when it began to smell at Pittsburgh. By 1924, the Army Corps of Engineers had become involved, issuing a rep report the following year calling for a series of dams and emphasizing the role of dams in power production. The rationale for the dam shifted again after a record-setting flood struck Pittsburgh in 1936. And at that time, Congress passed the first of three flood control acts dealing with the city and its surrounding areas. And these acts included Kinzua as one of a series of nine reservoirs. However, no funds were appropriated, and this was also the case for subsequent acts. Nevertheless, it was at this time that the corn planters, the people living down here on the corn planter grant, were concerned that ultimately there would be funds um, for this, and they con contacted anthropologists um, in the mid-1930s, asking for their help in rallying support to make sure this didn't happen. Also opposing construction were officials of the Department of the Interior and the Public Lands Division of the Department of Justice on the grounds that the lands of the Seneca Nation were protected by the 1794 Pickering Treaty, which was signed in Canandaigua, New York. Oscar Chapman, the Assistant Secretary of the Interior, wrote to the Department of the Army, noting that even if the Senecas consented to sell their land, as required by the terms of the treaty, Congress would still need to pass a separate act in recognition that the treaty was being broken. <coughs> so the threat of the dam therefore receded for the Senecas, because they firmly believed this, this treaty would protect them. And so they weren't prepared um, for the changes that would occur following the election of Dwight Eisenhower in 1952. Houtman has already argued persuasively that the fight to stop Kinsua Dam was, was doomed from the moment Eisenhower took office. Named to the head of a newly created Office of Special Assistant to, for Public Works Planning on the White House staff was Major John Bragdon. He was a Pittsburgh native, he was educated at Carnegie Mellon, and he was a former Deputy Chief of the Corps of Engineers. Another key Eisenhower advisor was General Lucius Clay, who had served in the Pittsburgh District of the Corps of Engineers and had been an early proponent of dam construction. The Seneca Nation that confronted the renewed dam threat was clearly no match for the federal executive. The government met twice a year, primarily to discuss lease issues. 
Elections were won on the basis of family alliances and personality. There were few issues, no full-time officials, no staff, and only one government building. Women, the traditional mothers of the nation and the owners of the land, had no voice in Seneca politics as they had been excluded from voting and holding office by the Constitution adopted when the Seneca Nation was formed in 1848. Despite their lack of training and experience, Seneca officials realized by September of, seven, of 1956 that the new threat was more serious than the previous ones. And they sent their attorney, Edward O'Neill, who had worked in the Public Lands Division of the Department of Justice, along with a five-man delegation to meet with representatives of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. Under their newly elected president, the Senecas now began to actively seek public support for the retention of their land. They turned first to the Philadelphia Yearly Meeting of Friends, the Quakers, their historic allies since the end of the 18th century. The Quakers mounted an offensive alongside the Senecas that was long-term, highly visible on a national level, and utilized very powerful symbolic images that brought to the fore the moral significance of breaking a treaty in order to take the Seneca lands. The Quakers also put the Senecas in contact with Arthur Morgan, the former head of the Tennessee Valley Authority and a longtime foe of the Corps of Engineers. With his former colleague, Barton Jones, um, Morgan was instrumental in delaying construction by proposing alternative plans which would spare Seneca land. Um, as a Salamanca attorney pointed out, however, they would take land from white folks and, as he said, white folks vote. Um, so there's a clear element of, of racism entering into this. Additional support for the Senecas came from the American Civil Liberties Union, the Association of American Indian Affairs, New York Governor Averill Harriman, uh, New York Times columnist Brooks, Brooks Atkinson, and the Cherokee Nation, along with, with many others. The focus now th to, to stop the dam was a $1 million line item um, in an $800 million public works appropriations bill. A move to delete this line item for Kinzua Dam had been defeated by a vote of 122 to 43. However, Morgan's reputation was such that the Corps sim simply couldn't dismiss his criticisms of their, their plans. And so, <coughs> excuse me, the Corps agreed to hire an independent firm um, to evaluate its plans as well as those that were prepared by Morgan. Unknown to Morgan and the Senecas at the time, the independence of this firm was highly suspect since three of its four founders were members that had been members of the Corps and the major um, client for the, the firm had been the Corps of Engineers for the past two decades. In February of 1958, the Seneca attorney at O'Neill returned to the federal court to seek an injunction, claiming that an act of Congress was required to break the Pickering Treaty, which had been stated by the Department of Justice 30 years earlier. The next month, U.S. District Judge McGarrigy denied the request, finding that Congress had signaled its intent to break the treaty by the passage of the line item. Um, and by providing funds for the dam. The Senecas appealed, their appeal was denied, um, and in July of 1959, the Supreme Court refused to review the lower court's decision. So all legal options to halt the construction had now closed. Appeals to President Kennedy, newly elected, fell on deaf ears as he claimed that the Supreme Court had already ruled and therefore there was nothing for him to do. Um, however, this was a very blatantly political uh, response. The Supreme Court decision had merely said that the, court, the, that the dam could be built. It did not say that it had to be built. And so what the Senecas were trying to do was to get Kennedy to withdraw support for the dam. Kennedy said no. Um, although in a very roundabout way. Elected by a narrow margin and owing much to the Democratic machine of Pennsylvania governor and former Pittsburgh mayor David Lawrence, um, Kennedy was not about to alienate those who had provided him with, with critical support in that close election. Political changes as a result of the threat and reality of removal can be seen early in the Senate experience. 
In 1958, leadership passed from the People's Party to a relatively new party, the Veterans Party. Despite the successful attempts of the Seneca president to rally allies and draw attention to the nation's plight, there was an increased feeling that the nation needed newer, stronger leadership. Seneca leaders, through no fault of their own, were ill-equipped to take on the federal government. At the same time, younger men, more experienced in non-Indian ways and better educated, were waiting in the wings to assume leadership. Their ascent to positions of power was hastened, but not caused by um, the damn fight. With women still disenfranchised, the core of the new party consisted of veterans of World War II in Korea, nearly all of whom were high school graduates with experience in the military, bureaucracy, and urban areas. Their leader was George Heron, a war hero with three citations for valor in World War II. He and Basil Williams, his running mate from the Cattaraugus Reservation, would serve as the nation's executive for six years, providing for stability and leadership as a critical time. This happens very rarely in the Seneca Nation, so it's, it's important. I mean, it may sound trivial, but it's really important that you have these two people in office for six consecutive years. But political changes were seen at more than just the leadership level. The Seneca government had begun an irreversible march toward an institutional bureaucracy. By 1962, the council, which had met twice a year, was meeting on a monthly basis. In order to coordinate activities, the nation appointed its first ever full-time employee when former president and then treasurer George Heron was named as administrator. The Kinzua Planning Committee, comprised of, this, the, of the executive branch as well as six counselors and volunteers, was placed in charge of the planning process. And they did this by setting up seven committees that were focused on particular issues, finding new land, designing houses, relocating cemeteries, etc. Its decisions, however, once met, had to be approved by the council, but since council members sat on those committees, that was not a problem. Women played significant roles as committee members, despite the fact that they were still denied suffrage. In fact, these committees were the stage upon which women fine-tuned their skills and developed savvy in the Seneca political arena. In 1964, a referendum granting women the right to vote finally passed on its fourth attempt since 1956. And two years later, the Constitution would be amended to allow women to hold office. And one of the first problems they confronted was where were they going to relocate? And so this is the Allegheny Reservation, and only two suitable areas were able to be identified, okay? The one is Jimerson Town up here. This abuts the city of Salamanca. And the other is down here in Steenburg, much closer to the flood. But, okay. Now, it looks like that doesn't take up much of the reservation, but what you have to realize is there are six congressional villages. These are villages of whites who live on the reservation under leases granted by Congress. And so Vandalia, Carrollton, Kilbuck, Salamanca, and West Salamanca, those are populated primarily by whites, or they certainly were at this time. And so when you take out this 10,000 acres, and roughly 10,000 acres taken up by these villages, what the Senecas had left was 10,000 acres that was mostly steep and, and hilly. Um, at hillsides. And so the only two suitable areas were the two that I just showed you. They're 12 miles away at the time, and actually until the 1990s, um, they were in different phone directories, and the rates were billed at long distance rates. So to call someone back and forth was expensive. With the construction of Route 17, okay, this is the Southern Tier Expressway, Route 17. That's now becoming Interstate 86. Um, with the construction of that, there was no way to get to one reservation from the other without getting on that limited access highway. You could no longer walk along the river. So communication between the two was severely limited, and as a result, the communities began to develop in different, in different directions. 
The first task facing families was the decision as to where to locate. Um, many of the more traditional people located to Steenburg because that was where the, the church of the followers of Handsome Lake had determined to relocate. Families that had older children, particularly teenagers, tended to go to Jimerson Town because Jimerson Town was where the high school was and that was where their children were going to have to school, have to go to school and so this would facilitate them participating in after school activities. So to some extent you get an older versus younger division um, in, the, in the communities. And what was going to happen in the future too is that Jimerson Town, because it, it had more land available, that was where the school, the, the, the school was, it was where the nation was going to build its new office building, it's where the museum was, the bowling alley, the library, and so it really becomes the, the focal point um, for Allegheny. Social changes were most obvious in the new housing. The replacement houses had a maximum lot size of three acres and they were designed in, in both relocation centers. They were on a figure eight. So there were two, two loops, two figure eights um, in each um, relocation center. And for the first time, the Senecas confronted the problems of nearby neighbors, loose dogs, overheard conversations, loud music. And for people who were used to dozens of acres, the confinement in a suburban um, style sort of housing arrangement um, was simply claustrophobic. Um, there was general agreement that the new housing was better than the old. I mean, it had indoor plumbing, which many didn't have. Um, but despite the material improvements that were usually the focal point for outsiders, um, it was clear to and people at Allegheny that there were many very tangible losses. Most frequently was the loss of visiting, uh, where people would travel for some distance to see a friend or relative and then spend the day exchanging information, sharing food, telling stories. Storytelling was a, a, has a long history among the Senecas. And this began to, to disappear. And while, because when you can see people on a daily basis, um, the old style of visiting began to lose its purpose and most people seemed to feel that what was happening was you were ha they, pe they were having more brief um, and more superficial encounters when they did um, visit. Perhaps for compensation as part of this loss, there was a rapid increase in the number of formal clubs and other organizations. While people were meeting almost daily about political issues surrounding the removal, there was a strong attempt to remain to, to retain a sense of social solidarity. There were groups that held potluck dinner, dinners, there were organizations for teens, for seniors, for sports teams, all of which served to bring people together in a non-stressful environment. And what's interesting is that as people began to feel at home, if any of you are familiar with the scudder Colson model, that's the stage four, um, when people seem to acclimate more to the relocation centers, nearly all of those clubs disappeared. So I think their, their function and transition was, was, is demonstrated by that. But they did play an important part in maintaining a sense of Senec identity and in some cases went on to maintain a focus on the needs and issues of a particular group, such as the seniors, uh, which was the, the elders. And, and, and so the kinds of things that they did really pointed the direction to the, the nation for future programs for the elderly, most of which have remained today. Um, concern for children and adolescents is shown in the formation of a number of, of clubs directed to them. The problem was, how do you get kids from one place to another? So they were always looking for chaperones, they were always looking for cars, and it just didn't work very well. And that, the, you know, there was not a critical number of kids in each reservation to do it, to do it separately. Now, as individuals, um, there was certainly increased stress, um, which is reflected in an increased mortality rate, particularly among the, the elders. Everybody reported that the elders died in large numbers, usually of a broken heart. Um, However, it's important to note that there were some, mostly middle-aged, who were invigorated by this fight to stop the dam and then to create a, a new future in the new communities. 
As the adults, many of whom had fought hard to stop Kinzu and now regrouped to fight for the best possible settlement, the concerns of children were often left out of the process. Social scientists at the time concentrated on adults, so there are no contemporary reports of children's reactions. Many of the parents um, I spoke with were unaware of their children's feelings because, as one, as one told me, we were simply too busy. Um, and that was really, he wasn't making a callous response. I mean, th they were meeting every night at the Long House. There were committees constantly. Um, and so the Senecas had really learned that whatever good was going to come from this would be something that they would have to fight for. And that even though they had a solid coterie of outside supporters putting pressure on Congress, the outlines of the final settlement would have to be determined by the people at Allegheny themselves. All of the conflicting reactions of the parents were transmitted to the children. Those who were pre-adolescent at the time recalled that their parents were frequently absent at night. And when they came home, they spoke in hushed Seneca, which the children didn't understand. And so that really increased their anxiety. They could, several of them talked about, they could hear their, they, they saw their father crying, which they had never seen before, and they didn't know what was happening. Some children learned about the dam for the first time at school. Um, one told me about racing home from school because the teacher had said there was going to be this dam and his house was going to be underwater, and he didn't believe it, and he ran home. Assuming, of course, his mother would say this was not going to happen, only to have her tearfully acknowledge that, yes, it, yes, it was. Um, the one teacher um, told the students about the dam, then turned all the lights off and played Johnny Cash's song, As Long As the Grass Shall Grow, which was a song about broken treaties that included um, the Senecas. So many of the things, like draping the windows of the school in, in dark, in, in black cloth when the bodies were being moved from the adjacent cemetery, was supposed to reduce the stress on children, but it had exactly the opposite effect. Um, one of the things that surprised me was that the, the, I was talking to adults who were children at the time, and they never talked about it among themselves. And to this day, they are surprised. Why didn't they talk about it with, with their friends? Um, and that somehow must relate to a level of trauma, but we couldn't figure out precisely why. Um, parents nearly always focused, um, excuse, let me go back. Um, parents' descriptions of the children's reactions were often a great variance uh, with the children's own recollections as adults. Parents nearly always underestimated the stress, the fear, and the grief, and the anger that was experienced by their children, instead emphasizing to them the material benefits. And it is likely that the parents, struggling with their own grief reactions, um, probably couldn't stand the possibility of, of seeing that in their children. Um, and the children recognize that. I mean, they didn't ask, they didn't ask their parents either because they knew how upset their parents were and they were afraid of their parents' reaction. They didn't want to add to their distress. For all of the Senecas, the images of before the, the dam was flooded, they came through and they bulldozed the houses and then they burned them. And this image of bulldozed and burning houses is seared into, um, the, the memories of anyone who was there at the time, and they can still talk about that, and when they do, they cry, regardless of, of their age. Um, people now in their late 50s and early 60s still talk about the, the, the medicines that were collected um, by their grandparents. They wish they paid more attention to what their grandparents were doing. Um, the, the cultural loss, the loss of botanical knowledge, um, by the 1990s, there were still a few elders who were going down into the areas that were not flooded and collecting medicines and plants. And at the same time, that the Seneca Nation began to hire young people to go and, and record on videotape and audio tape the recollections of, of the elders, usually starting with their own, with their own grandparents. Groundbreaking for the dam occurred on October 22, 1960. Former Pittsburgh mayor and now Governor David Lawrence stated, and this is really kind of incredible when you think about it, quote, 
Kinzua Dam will someday stand as a living, useful reminder of the first lesson of good government. The needs of human welfare come first. It is really difficult to see any concern for human welfare in the story of Kinzua to this point. There was no involvement of any of the congressional committees. There was no consideration of the impact or the cost of removal on the Senecas or on the Seneca culture. There was no recognition that they'd only have 10,000 acres of land left. And in fact, it would be 27 months after the dedication of the dam before Congress would turn its attention to the people whose homes it condemned. And the Senecas pointed out that the Pennsylvania Railroad got the final payment of its $20 million before Congress even started to talk about the Senecas. Now, the first, the first consideration of the Seneca's needs occurred in, in June of 1962 when the, the BIA sent someone to do a survey of the reservation. Um, and he reported 130 households with 482 people in the take area, which was below the, th this is the 1365-foot contour. So this is supposed to be the maximum extent of the pool. It actually gets bigger than that. But the land below that line was the land that was condemned. Well, as, as several people have already noted, the, the actual number was far greater. Because at the suggestion of a Seneca official, um, I undertook a house by house, plot by plot survey, continually checking the maps and lists with former residents, both homeowners and renters. Renters tend to get ignored. They counted people who owned houses. They didn't count the people who might have rented that house. Um, and so my list came to 258 families with 674 individuals. By, and my numbers increased because I counted men who were in the military, who were coming back but weren't there then, and the families that lost most of their land but not their house. So for example, he didn't count them. If you had a house that was right there, you got to keep your house. But if this was all of your land, too bad. So it, it, you know, it, the impact on them was as bad as it was for, for the others. Um, what, what's my time? Okay. Okay, let me, let me, let me skip to looking at um, activism and youth and some of the things that I think relate to the land. Um, the connection to the land wasn't severed with removal. Children who were born in the relocation communities felt a connection to the, what they call the old places because they visited with their families and they'd heard the stories um, about the old places. Although the Senecas now occupy only a small part of their aboriginal territory, this land had never been ceded to a foreign power. It's part of their cultural heritage, it's part of their history, and it's part of their future. And right to the land is the one thing that all Senecas share. Regardless of where they live, it grounds them literally as well as <coughs> figured. <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> By the 1980s, <coughs> thank you. By the 1980s, many of the young Senecas who had been born in <coughs> the new communities came to believe that their parents hadn't fought hard enough to stop the dam. And they didn't see any benefits in removal. It was completely, absolutely negative. For them, Kinzua had become a potent symbol of the loss of land. A more pressing issue is increased population confronted a diminished land base. In September of 1984, September 19th, the president designated the day as Remember the Removal Day, quote, in remembrance of those Senecas who relinquished their lands, their homes, and a way of life. This has now become an annual event in the third Saturday of September. Therefore, when new threats to the land appeared, the reaction now was much different. During the condemnation of land for the dam and over Seneca objections, the federal courts had permitted the Corps to condemn lands for a four-lane limited access highway. Okay, this was a two-lane highway. And as part of the dam, they condemned land for four, a four-acre limited access highway. Um, 
And in 1976, the nation had signed an agreement with New York providing for an easement on the final 16-mile segment. And compensation was paid to the nation with, uh, in terms of money, land, and in payments to individual landowners. But landowners had to negotiate um, on their own with the state. But if that failed to occur, the nation gave the this New York State the right to use eminent domain to take the land. Many saw this highway as beneficial, uh, both Indian and non-Indian, uh, uh, because it would be an incentive to business and the tourist trade. But some landowners refused to settle with the state, and a crisis was reached in the summer of 1985 when the state began construction on the final stretch through these properties. Protests erupted, leading to a brief shutdown of construction as protesters built a small longhouse, um, symbolic of their commitment to the retention of Seneca land and tradition. Joining the landowners in the protest were young women who remembered the old places in the river, had traumatic recollections of removal, and were determined that no more land would be lost. They were college educated, one of the benefits of relocation. They had left Allegheny for that education, become involved in pan-Indian movements and social activism. But returning to the res, they initially focused on traditional women's issues. Many of them focused on kids. The group they formed was called the Seneca Women's Awareness Group, and it drew its membership from women of all ages and began to expand into other more political issues. It was this group that had first proposed the Remember the Removal Day. But with the protest at Camp 17, Camp 17, which is the name they gave to their protest, support for more moderate women began to dissipate. This doesn't reflect a generational divide as much as it does a difference in perspectives and methods. Uh, women and men who were critical publicly of the activists um, I saw smiling very broadly as they watched the confrontation between um, the young people and the police. One said she, there was no, you know, they weren't going to win this fight. And it's not really a generational divide. What, what the older people had learned was you pick your fights carefully. And this wasn't one they were going to win. Okay, what can we learn from the Senecas? Well, I think there are, uh, the Senec experience illustrates a number of elements that can ease the stress of relocation for relatively small groups if implemented. Most importantly, the population to be re relocated needs consistent long-term allies who live with the people, have no vested interest in the development project, and can derive no benefit from it. For the Senecas, this was the Philadelphia Quakers. The century and a half old connection proved invaluable, especially when the friends sent Walt Taylor the former head of the American Friends Service Committee to Allegheny in 1962. Taylor moved in with his wife, his kids, and remained there for the next three years, playing a major role in facilitating the actions decided upon by the Senecas. Even after he retired and moved to, to British Columbia, he and his wife came back, and the Senecas still revere Walt Taylor. He's, he's now passed. Um, the representative of the Bureau of Indian Affairs, Sid Carney, also moved with his family and stayed until the mid-1960s. Um, now, bureaucrats tend to focus on formal institutions, but in the Seneca experience, it was informal social networks and power structures that played the major role. In particular, volunteers from outside the formal political structure who populated the critical committees not only eased the transition, but added a sense of participation in the process and control over the future um, that prevented the development of widespread feelings of victimization. This is not to suggest that the Seneca Nation and people didn't think they'd been screwed, they did, um, or that there weren't individuals whose anger never dissipated, but rather the overall response was to make the best of a, of a great injustice. Among the important contributors to the committees were women. And one of the things that I was interested in was that women dominated the committees that dealt with traditional women's things, like education, like housing. And with, well, they weren't enfranchised at the time, and so what they did was the nation decided to take most of the rehab money and put it into education. And what the women did on the, on the education committee was create an entirely new foundation that was outside the male political power structure so that this, you know, millions of dollars would be controlled not by the Seneca government, but by the women. Um, 
Uh, the one, um, okay, I'm trying to go quickly. One of the things that, that they did to integrate the kids that, that was, I think, really helpful was that Walt Taylor had a newsletter that was telling everybody what the meetings were, you know, all of those kinds of neat things. But each newsletter had drawings, so children were allowed to submit their drawings. So they could, they could do that, and they'd have their name on the cover. Um, the, they ran contests to try to get the kids to name the new buildings. And they asked the, the, you know, the older kids, the teenagers, what it was that they wanted um, for their education, what kinds of programs they wanted. So the children were, in fact, um, integrated. And to, to recap what has been said previously, one of the difficulties here in trying to, to tease out the, the effects of removal from broader developments is that with the new frontier and the great society, there were lots of new social programs. So how does the, the Seneca re reaction to removal, how can you separate what's removal related and what's related to those programs? But I think it's very clear that had it not been for the Kinzua fight, the kinds of organization, the kinds of skills, and the connections that people made, they would not have been able to take control of those, of those programs. And the same is true for, for the activism. I think that the, the widespread um, social movements of the 1960s um, certainly influenced some of the women. Um, it was interesting, though, feminism, they absolutely said feminism has nothing to do with this. We are not interested in feminism. And they, they told me, and they were quite disparaging, they said, feminism for you white women. We don't need it. <laughs> We know who we are. They had always been and would continue to be the mothers of the nation. Those matrilineal ties are phenomenally strong, and I had not appreciated that. So officials and bureaucrats who create the need for dislocation of communities primarily focus on the material advantages that they believe will accrue to those who have removed. They equate houses with homes and view land as a commodity that's readily bought and sold with few, if any, consequences. That land and home are synonymous for many indigenous people is unknown, unacknowledged, or incomprehensible. For the Senecas, the land under Kinzua Dam Reservoir is still their home, even if they don't live there anymore. Joy, thank you for. Um a oh, very touch, touching paper. I first read about um, Joy's book years back when I was starting out as a graduate student. Uh, my own research deals with the politics of resettlement. And the interesting aspect that often comes out is the people who get displaced by dam usually are the ones who are at the margins of society. It's not a coincidence about who gets displaced. It, it's never a displacement. And it's not that... Um, planners or, or social scientists um, think in, in different ways. We all realize where the power equation lies. The chances that somebody will get displaced because they're from a marginal group or because they're from um, um, a rural setting with have mu which has much lesser voice is way more than the chances of you being from an urban center or being from well-off, well-connected, and getting displaced. But the point is that we can move beyond the framework of victimhood framework to then look at how there's intergenerational frustration, intergenerational learning. There's, also, there's the loss, but the, the, how life doesn't stop. It continues. Um, so let's now move on to our fourth and final speaker for today, and that's Heather Randall. Um, Heather is a postdoctoral fellow at the National Social Environmental Synthesis Center, University of Maryland, Annapolis. Her paper is um, Development, Dams, and Displacement in the Amazon, the case of Brazil's Belo Monte Hydroelectric Complex. To quickly introduce Heather, um, she's a sociologist and a demographer interested in the relationship between environmental change, development, and human health, as well as well-being. She is a postdoctoral fellow, as I described, and before that, she was a PhD student here at Brown itself, uh, where she got a degree um, last year in 2015 in sociology. She was a graduate fellow in the Institute at Brown for Environment and Society. Over to Heather. Thank you.
All right, thanks so much, Vikram. Uh, thanks to the Middle East Studies Program. Uh, so this work is based on uh, my dissertation work that I did here in the Department of Sociology, um, which I just finished in December. So it's really nice to be back so soon to talk to you all and uh, tell you about what I found. So um, I did my work on the Bellamanchi Dam, which is, I guess, a nice way to end this day because it's being constructed right now. So a lot of the dams that were built in the 60s and the 70s, um, there are some lessons to be learned from them. And I, I would argue that at least some uh, lessons have been applied in the case of this dam. So I'll start out uh, giving you a bit of history of the region. Um, so the Belamonchi Dam is uh, being constructed in, uh, in the Amazon, in the state of Pará, in the eastern Amazon. No, this is not working. The uh, there is no other one. There is a head-like structure there. Oh, this. Oh, wow. I didn't. I thought it was a pen. Okay. So in the um, in the state of Pará, and um, it's on the Shingu River, which flows in this direction and is a main tributary to the Amazon. And um, this, uh, the Shingu is really high in biodiversity, high in endemic fish populations. So um, this region, and really the Amazon in general, has a really interesting history. Um, in starting in about 1970, the Brazilian government had a huge development scheme uh, for the Amazon region. They built highway projects, they built dams, they invested in agriculture, and uh, in particular, they invested in settlement programs to move people from other parts of the country um, to settle the Amazon and farm it. So they, in addition to conducting the Trans-Amazon Highway, which runs in red, um, they, there was the Trans-Amazon Settlement Scheme, which is how a lot of the population arrived to this region. Um, and that led to massive deforestation. So it's within Brazil's arc of deforestation. Um, so a lot of the area is deforested, um, especially around the Trans-Amazon. And also to the growth of population centers and cities, um, which are quite pr uh, prevalent in the Amazon. Um, so now the region is um, an area of agro-pastoral activity. Um, it's one of the highest productivity cacao growing areas in the country. It has large amounts of cattle production, as well as fisheries uh, for both food and also for the aquarium trade. Um, Altamira up here in orange is the urban center of the Trans-Amazon region. Um, it has about 100,000 people. It's where the main market is, um, where goods and services for the rural farm economy are kind of based, um, and also has small branches of both the state and federal universities. So uh, the Belamonchi Dam has a quite long and contentious history. Um, it was originally conceived in 1975 during uh, Brazil's dictatorship. And um, the reason that it's being built in the particular area that it is, so Belamonchi is up here, is uh, because of the shape of the river. So there's a big bend in the river and also a decline in, um, in um, altitude. And one of the an dam engineers actually said, God only makes a place like Belamanchi once in a while. This, this place was made for a dam because you can build a, a um, comparatively low dam for the amount of energy generated. So they were like intent on building this dam. But the original da um, dam design was actually a complex of six dams throughout the whole region. And um, it was the, so six dams on, on two rivers that would flood 20,000 kilometers and affect 37 different indigenous groups. And there was understandably a lot of uh, people upset about the social and environmental impacts of these dams. And um, one kind of historic moment in the history of Belamonchi is um, in 1989, there was a large um, gathering, a protest event in Altamira that, um, that involved a bunch of tribes, um, as well as journalists, as well as environmentalists, academics, um, celebrities, including Sting. And kind of the, the, the moment that everyone remembers is when um, a Kayapo woman um, named Tuira um, kind of held a machete to one of the dam engineers. And that's kind of um, this pivotal moment in the protest of the dam. So the dam was tabled for a while but um, was pushed forward in the early 2000s um, 
in, as part of former President Lula's um, program to accelerate, uh, accelerate growth. And it was really seen as a necessary source of energy to provide tens of millions of Brazilian households with um, electricity. And the dam was redesigned in the 2000s, and it was reduced drastically in size to only one dam complex, which is the now Belamonte Dam, which reduced the area flooded and actually um, is not flooding any indigenous land at all anymore. But despite the improvements, it's still incredibly controversial due to its environmental and social impacts. And you see um, uh, uh, indigenous protests here saying, um, uh, Norche Energia, the dam building company, Belamonchi brings violence, insecurity, destruction, and death. Um, and really, a lot of the protests are centered on the, the uh, impacts on indigenous people, despite the fact that they're not directly being displaced, um, changes in water quality, habitat for fish species, as well as drying out part of the river um, during the dry season, which will affect some um, indigenous lands that live near that part of the river. So as I mentioned, uh, Norche Energia is a is the kind of a, a consortium that's uh, constructing the dam, and the government is a 49.98 percent shareholder of this. So you can't say that it's the government that's constructing it, but um, more or less. Um, so the dam is it's an interesting uh, complex. So it's kind of a whole region. So there's um, the primary dam that diverts water through canals into a reservoir, which then brings water to the main powerhouse. Um, so this area, the big bend of the Shingu River, is um, what's going to be have a reduced water flow, particularly during the dry season. And um, construction began in 2011, and when complete in 2019, it'll be the third largest dam in the world in energy generating capacity. Um, it has a capacity of over 11,000 megawatts. Um, so the flooding is uh, supposed to be about 500 square kilometers, which is much smaller than it was uh, intended to be at first, but about 10, almost 10 providences would fit in it. So it's pretty substantial still. And there's three indigenous groups that live uh, on the Big Bend down here that will be impacted, not displaced, but impacted by the fact that the flow will affect fish populations, will affect their ability to navigate on the river. Um, and the expected displacement is approximately 20,000, and that's what was calculated before. I don't know, I, I don't know um, exactly how many people in the end were displaced, um, but probably about that. And the majority of people are actually in the city of Altamira along the banks, so about 16,000 in Altamira, and then um, rural farming populations in the area where the reservoir is, where the infrastructure is, and then there's um, small amounts of fishermen who, live on, who lived on islands in, um, in the region. And as part of the kind of whole social and environmental program, uh, North Energia is investing in the region by building hospitals, schools, health posts, sanitation projects, um, et cetera. And there's also a, been a massive influx of migrants into Altamira for dam-related uh, employment opportunities, which have pushed up costs, and um, particularly for rent and for food, and have really put a strain on public services in the region. So for my dissertation, um, I focused on the population that lived in this region where the reservoir now is. So I didn't study uh, directly the urban population, but I wanted to give you a little overview since that's kind of the majority of people who are being displaced. So most of the urban population um, lived in areas that looked like this. Um, they're in the floodplain of a small kind of stream tributary to the Shingu River. Um, and they lived in kind of makeshift homes on stilts because during the rainy season, so this is kind of during the dry season, and you see their, their walkways and stilts. And then during the rainy season, the water would come up basically to the bottom of their houses and they didn't have sanitation, um, so kind of fairly basic living conditions. There were people that um, in other parts of the city, but this is kind of the majority of them. So the compensation program for the urban population was, in theory, kind of, they had three choices. 
you can get resettled in a new house that the dam building company built, which are these. Um, you could get kind of a credit payment to buy another house, or you can get money in cash. And the dam building company portrayed this as a major improvement in the lives of the people because they were living in, in, um, in, you know, in these houses on stilts that were prone to flooding and didn't have sanitation. Um, and the issues, so I think, I'm pretty sure that the majority of people picked this because the cash that they were offered was not quite enough in the face of rising prices for um, buying property or rent in the region, not quite enough to buy much. Um, so the dam building company build, built five new neighborhoods, but they were all on the periphery of the city. And the areas where the people used to live were right in downtown. It was close to work. It was close to school. It was close to their friends and family. Um, and these resettlement areas were quite far and then you know comes issues of separating community members how do you get to work all of those issues um, so resettlement for the urban uh, population just has happened in the last like year or two so um, it's kind of still tbd what will happen with them so i studied uh, this rural population who lived now where the reservoir is and um, the population, most of them moved to the region during the government's colonization program that I mentioned in the 70s. Um, some moved more recently. Many were, lived there for decades. They built a community. They came when the area was still forest and turned it to farms. Um, and many of the younger households were born there. So that was really all that they knew. And the people ranged from, um, many were smallholder cacao farmers. Um, there were a lot of landless sharecroppers or people who didn't own land and they just kind of lived on their family's land and helped them out, um, up to wealthier cattle ranchers. So it really kind of ran the socioeconomic gamut. And so in 2011 is when the dam construction began, and that's also when they started visiting households to um, determine what people would get, calculate what they owned. Um, and then I collected baseline data with uh, some research assistants in 2012, which was before the majority of households had moved. Um, and during the baseline data collection, which was household surveys and interviews, uh, we asked them for contact info for friends or family, you know, how can we find you after you move? And then during this interim period where most of the households had moved, um, we drove around the region on motorcycles and found people. Um, it was kind of a an array of uh, word of mouth of where people lived and, um, and just kind of wandering many miles on trans Amazon roads um, because people don't have self service in the rural areas. So it was, uh, it was interesting and quite challenging, but we were able to, um, we uh, baseline data was with almost 200 households and we were able to find 86% um, of them. And then um, we conducted follow-up interviews and surveys um, after everyone moved. And then, so just earlier this year, uh, the first turbine began running and generating energy. There's now three turbines running of a total of 24. So um, the area is, is flooded and uh, things are moving along. So um, the compensation program for the rural households, although Officially, it said that they had the same three options as the urban households. Um, it was really um, kind of two, well, really one option. So people who owned land were compensated in cash, and people who were landless were provided with a credit payment for a fixed amount. And the way that comp the compensation for the landowners was calculated was um, by kind of, uh, you can see some of uh, the the, pay, the calculations here, but uh, a kind of a mixture of productive assets, cacao trees, crops, as well as pasture, homes, uh, infrastructure that you had on your uh, property. And the assets were assessed, someone visited you, and within 90 days you were supposed to get a proposal. Um, and if things were left off, if they didn't count enough cacao trees, you can say, you know, please redo it. And then if you still weren't happy with it, they said, tough luck, you can go to court, which a lot of people didn't have the money or really know how to do. 
Um, and people were then responsible for finding their own land after they were given the money. Um, with, when they received their payment, they had 30 days to vacate their land and find a new place to move. And the company would transport their stuff it, if it was within a 250 kilometer radius. So there were a lot of issues with the compensation program. Um, one of which was delays. So like I said, it was supposed to take 90 days. Um, some people waited two years to get their proposal. Uh, the dam building company said, don't, don't farm anymore. You don't have to plant. You'll be getting a proposal in 90 days. It's not worth it. Well, you can imagine if people are farming food that they're eating and things that they're selling, um, that that would be quite a strain on these households. In addition, the company was paying people in two installments. They would pay um, the people who got cash. They would pay half, and then after you vacated your land, they would give you the other half. But if you're buying new land and it's more than half of the amount that you got, it creates some problems for paying the person who's selling you their land. A lot of people said that they should have paid everyone before construction activities even began because people are still there while there's, you know, the river's getting dirty because of the, all the dust and then there's cars and trucks and um, it's very hectic. In addition, um, the credit payment that people who didn't own land received, um, many, you know, thought that it wasn't really enough to actually buy a new property, um, let alone a property with productive assets on it. Um, in addition, there were issues with kind of the amount of compensation people could get for cacao. If it's two years old, you get X amount. If it's four years old, you get like five times the amount. Um, and by the time people were paid, their cacao was four years old, but they were paid for it being two years old. Um, low compensation for pasture, no compensation for forested land, even though people were required by law to leave a percentage of their land in forest. Um, as well as prices for land in the region rising rapidly because of all of this in-migration due to the dam. So what ended up happening? It sounds like there were a lot of issues. Um, this is uh, the foundation of one of the houses after people left. So of, uh, of the the households that I studied and was able to track, um, the green dots are kind of the approximate locations of where they moved. This is where everyone started. Um, so it's about like 250 kilometers down the Trans-Amazon in each way. Um, and then only two households moved far away to another state, um, which is interesting. So most people chose to stay in the Trans-Amazon region, around Altamira, around uh, Vittorio du Xingu, which is the municipality where they originally lived. 75% um, of people bought new rural property and stayed in rural areas. About a quarter moved to cities, most of uh, which were Altamira. And some people actually bought both rural and urban properties, um, so they were able to com um, drive income from both places. So how did people invest their compensation payments? Um, so nearly all of them, 96%, invested in land and or housing. Um, so that's a good start. Uh, that's the the goal um, to restore the land and housing you lost. In addition, um, a lot of people invested in vehicles. And this is really important because the road quality in the region can be really poor, um, even along the Trans-Amazon. And there's very limited public service. So about 34% of people, for example, bought either a car or a pickup truck with their compensation. And this enables people to travel to Altamira to visit family, to access services, you know, go to the hospital, um, as well as to sell products at the market. And in addition to vehicles and houses, um, many people were able to invest in productive assets, assets that directly contribute to future income. Um, so 39% um, made agricultural investments, such as building fences, building corrals for their cattle, clearing pasture. 35% um, purchased new cattle. And a good proportion um, actually bought rental houses to rent out in Altamira, uh, which 
was a great source of income because rents had gone through the roof in the area. So there was actually um, quite a, a large percentage of people that were able to make important productive investments with their compensation in addition to buy new land and housing. Um, so just as an example of um, assets and, and housing, so from baseline to follow up, um, you know, ownership of cars increased from 5% to 28%. Electricity went from 46% to 87%. Um, households that were landless went from 39% to 24%. And the median land um, went from 45 to 98 hectares. So um, there's, you know, actually quite an improvement, at least if on these measures. But Assets and wealth are really only one metric when you're thinking about kind of a holistic, um, if you're thinking about the impacts holistically. And well-being, subjective well-being, how people f believe that their lives are, is, um, is another measure. It's a non-monetary measure, and I would argue it's a more holistic measure of someone's quality of life. And actually, 64% of people said that their well-being improved from before the dam. And I'll talk a little bit about these. So one of the um, main, main reasons for improving is 39% um, of uh, people didn't own a land at baseline and said that acquiring land was a primary reason that their life improved. Displacement and compensation basically served as an opportunity for landless households to acquire property, gave them more autonomy over their lives, and in turn, a better sense of well-being. And one of the former sharecroppers said, there we worked as sharecroppers with 3,000 cacao trees, and here we have 3,500 trees, and they're ours. Here, everything is ours. Here, the land provides enough for us to live peacefully. But if you look at people who did not say that their well-being improved, uh, one of the main reasons was actually deciding to move to an urban area. Um, people said that they missed their rural land, that Altamira was hot, noisy, polluted, violent. Um, and while migrating you know, gave them access to um, new economic and social conditions, really, for most of the households, the um, the changes to their lives and livelihoods outweighed the benefits of um, the opportunities that come with moving to an urban area. In addition, community is really important. So strong family and social networks are really key uh, social support during um, you know, periods of health or financial stress, exchange of goods and services, socialization. Um, and this, for example, is a poor family who wanted to stay in Vittorio de Shingu, which is where they originally lived, because I was born and raised there. I never thought I would come here. My mother and all my relatives lived there, but because we received little compensation, we had to move farther because closer is expensive. The bad thing is that our family stayed behind. On New Year's, the house used to be full of people. This year, we spent New Year's alone because, as they say, everything's changed. But um, despite that, just keep in mind that the majority of people were happy, and that was my experience um, with following up with households, that, which surprised me, actually, was, um, you know, given all of the issues I had heard about, was that actually most people were pretty happy and doing pretty well. So why? <laughs> Um, so one of the issues, and that's the, you know, the difference of working on a dam that is in the midst of being constructed now, is that there's been a lot of prior activism, particularly w within Brazil. There's an entire national social movement about people affected by dams. So there's been a lot of learning from past dams, and because of that, uh, the dam building company and the government have had a lot of pressure to invest uh, quite a bit in the resettlement program among other social and environmental programs. In addition, there happened to be ample land in the region. It varied greatly in quality, in size, in location, in distance from the city, but it was there. In addition, um, the displaced communities themselves really mobilized in strategic ways, which I'll talk a little bit about, and people had um, prior migration experience or their families did because this area had a history of, uh, of people migrating to it during the settlement scheme, um, and social networks because of that that extended beyond the area where they lived. So 
the area where people were displaced had a strong community organization uh, association. And there were a lot of kind of charismatic leaders during the beginning of the dam building process that led the efforts to fight for better compensation or you know, various issues related to um, displacement. But the leaders were always the first people to be paid off. And people said, you know, uh, this woman, she was, you know, she was led our association and she's gone. She was the first person. And every time someone steps up to the plate, they're paid off. So during this kind of long and protracted process of waiting for their displacement, um, a lot of community members developed strategies for how to more effectively mobilize despite this. And, um, one of their strategies was saying, we have no leaders. And this is um, a quote from one of the cacao farmers. We had the idea to unite ourselves for one objective. The last time that we had a meeting and Norche Energia came here, a representative from Norche Energia called the leader of our group outside, and we intervened. We said, here do, we do not have leaders, that the leaders are all of us, because we all want one thing, one unique objective. If they want to negotiate, they'll have to negotiate with all of us. We didn't come here for them to negotiate with one person. That was the problem that we created for them. So that's one kind of interesting way in which the delays in the process, which, um, you know, are not good in, in and of themselves, actually enabled people to gain experience and develop strategies to better achieve their aims and mobilize for better compensation. So that's one example. And the group held protests. There was a time where they, um, for three days, they blocked the street so that construction workers couldn't work. Um, and that was specifically to be so that um, I mentioned every, people were paid in two different installments and they wanted everyone to be paid in one installment and all at, at the same time because it was taking too long. They had many meetings with the dam building company um, and they, some of them even went to Brasilia, the capital of Brazil, to discuss uh, the price of cacao, for example. So kind of this suite, um, in addition to having help from um, kind of outside NGOs and lawyers and um, Brazilian government, some different government agencies, they were able to get the price of cacao um, raised uh, for the productive cacao, which is one of the many options, from 40 heais to 96 heais, so more than double. Um, after that protest that I mentioned, uh, the dam building company agreed to pay everyone by a deadline, and most of the families actually got it. And then also two payments were turned into, they were paying people in one payment. So, you know, it was, to an extent, quite effective um, strategies. I think I'll talk about this really quick. Um, and then social networks are another interesting reason uh, why people were generally able to do well. Um, people had family members, had friends who lived outside of the region, and a lot of people had knowledge of other parts of Brazil. So for, for example, um, this family had her, the wife's father had lived in, a, in another area for years. And so she was telling me, well, I already knew this area that they moved to, and my friend didn't. So we said to him, want to buy good land? Go there, where the road we're moving to, where there's a lot of land that people want to sell. There's the type of land you like with cacao and space for livestock. So he went to and bought, and then a friend of his went afterwards and bought too. So people were able to kind of help each other find land. In addition, people who received the credit payments that I mentioned were generally not very much, um, often combined them together. So they would combine two payments together to buy a property and then divide the property so every, each person could have half. Um, family members gave money to you know, their children who received credit payments to help top it off so that they could buy land that they didn't have enough. So there was a lot of kind of social strategies and reliance on social capital and networks that enabled people, um, many of the people, to do okay. So what are some lessons? Well, this is a unique case. Um, the Amazon settlement scheme gave people um, you know, migration experience. A lot of people were not, this is not a population that's incredibly embedded in the region for, you know, decades and decades and decades, only a few decades. Um, so people had translocal ties in other parts of the region and prior migration experience. And the, ne the networks that people had were really a key resource um, for the displaced household. So really, if you're thinking about um, a, a resettlement scheme, it's important to think about, you know, the history of the people in a location. So perhaps people with fewer uh, 
ties to other parts of the region uh, might be better served by a more organized resettlement program, for example. So I would argue that Bellamanchi's rural compensation program could be viewed as a successful model in certain cases. And really, the way that the compensation work gave households the freedom and opportunity to reinvest in new livelihoods, and these were often improved. And this model really only works if a, you provide sufficient compensation for households to replace lo lost land and housing as well as make additional investments. B, if you're implementing it in a region with ample land available. Um, and also, C, if it's provided with households with knowledge of the region and with social networks that extend to the region beyond. But there were a lot of issues which I mentioned that we can kind of think about and learn from. Um, there were long delays, like I said, there was no firm date on when the payment would arrive, and this led to a lot of psychological and financial stress for the households in the interim period. Um, and the households were resettled well after construction activities began. Like I mentioned, um, they were living among polluted water, heavy machinery, explosions during the day and night. Um, so those are just two of the issues. So I studied just the rural population and just about one to two years after displacement. So it's still TBD on the long-term impacts of the dam. And this is interesting. So this is a uh, Bar dos Bajeros, and Bajeros are um, basically dam builders. So they travel around Brazil building dams. So they have a bar here where they hang out and says, uh, the best point in Altamira. So obviously, when the dam construction is done, this bar will close, the Bajajeros will move on. So it's really important to get additional data collection after construction ends. You know, will Belamonchi actually lead to sustained, sustained economic development in the region? Will the rural households that I studied be able to maintain this gain over the long term, or really did they only see short-term gains associated with a windfall of cash? Um, what about the urban displaced population? Will they experience positive outcomes? You know, they'll clearly have a different set of challenges than the rural population. And then also the indigenous population in the region um, around the big bend of the river. So there's a lot that we don't know. Um, the dam is still being built, but it's um, at least some preliminary uh, hope that there's, there are good ways and there's definitely a lot that's been learned over the past many decades of dam construction. So thank you. Thanks, Heather, for the, uh, for the presentation. Just give me a minute and have the speakers um, coming here and for the Q&A. Um, thanks for all your patience and for staying for such a long session. I am hoping that uh, you have quite a few questions to ask. Before we begin, just a reminder. Um, Vincent has to leave early. He has a flight to catch, so he'll be leaving in 25 minutes. So those of you who have questions either directly for him or questions that is partially addressed towards him, please have a first go at him. Um, so let's begin at that. It's being recorded, so. Um, sure. Uh, I'm Andrea. I'm a, a Brazilian student at Harvard Graduate School of Design. My program is a Master in Design and Studies in Risk and Resilience, and I'm currently um, is studying uh, dam induced displacement. So thank you, Heather. I, I read her very interesting article, and she invited me to come here today. Thank you for inviting me. It's a very interesting forum. Uh, I took so many notes, and um, thank you so much for sharing these experiences. I think uh, the question I wanted to address to you, maybe to all of you, 
is about an actor that is typically absent from our discussion, the local and regional governments. Uh, just like uh, Joy, I really, um, I'm really interested about the local narratives. Um, I went to uh, Belo Monte recently, that's uh, one of my side of studies, and somebody told me, um, you know, uh, in the beginning, nobody wants to be affected by the dam. In the middle of the process, we realized that being considered affected is the only way to get any compensation. And towards the end of the process, everybody is really affected by the dam. There is no way to not uh, feel the uh, impacts. Um, so in the beginning, I think what we see is a, a David and Goliath narrative, except that Goliath always wins. <laughs> uh, uh, I think in, in the case of Belamonte, the indigenous peoples had a very strong narrative, uh, and uh, Norte Energia really tried to neutralize uh, that narrative by paying uh, uh, indigenous leaders to silence. Um, in 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 the, we didn't see the local government. We didn't see any uh, uh, like a local or regional vision being uh, debated. Uh, being a counterclaiming uh, uh, the national development plan. Then um, in, in, in the middle of the process, and I think we are still living, we are still uh, facing the middle of the process when it comes to resettlement. Um, what we see is that uh, uh, most of the local governments, the regional governments, they are underfunded, under, um, um, uh, undercapacitated, and so they cannot really offer the public services that the community expects. Uh, and then they sort of count on the uh, developer to build schools, uh, health centers, roads, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So we, we, we see Altamira and many other towns become a sort of a resource-led town. Uh, which really undermines the capacity of local governments to uh, deliver future services. So I think they are becoming even more um, uh, capable of governing the landscape. So one of the one of my um, understandings of uh, of Heather's uh, results is not that it was really uh, well. Very a very successful resettlement uh, methodology or, or process. But uh, what we see is that uh, 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 communities that are directly affected or are directly in the uh, landscape of the dam, they are disproportionately benefited by uh, the compensations. So those groups that were right on the reservoir, the main reservoir, I think they really needed it to be quickly resettled and compensated. And when we look at the urban scene, what we see is a very, is a, is a much, uh, it's a messy uh, process. So I would like to, to ask you, what do you think we should do in as beings, the World Bank or uh, the academia, in terms of strengthening local and the regional governments, would that make a difference in uh, them resettlement and displacement? Because uh, we don't see this actor very often uh, in our narratives, and uh, I, I think they are often weakened in the process. Um. The question is for Heather and for? OK, perfect. Maybe I could start? Yes, definitely. And that's a great question. <clears throat> Actually, there's a recognition on, uh, for dam projects and big infrastructure projects that uh, people who will be resettled directly affected by land banks will potentially benefit from the resettlement program if it's well designed. But also, the people who are not in directly land taking zone will be affected in other different ways negatively by the program. So in big infrastructure projects and particular for dams, now there's a recognition for the need for what I was calling a local area development plan in addition to the resource. 
development fund so that the overall region around the project will benefit economically and culturally from the project. So you don't end up with people being excluded from development and other regions benefiting from development. So that's on more on a technical level. And then there's also a whole new field of research that's been developed around benefits sharing for local communities affected by uh, resource extra extractive activities such as dams or mines, etc. And that's even been codified in law in certain countries. If you look at Colombia, they have a law that requires that if you build a dam, uh, local municipalities beside the dam have to receive part of the royalties, they have to receive payments over extended times, uh, there's no limit in time, from the project. So in other words, so there are different methods, but they're, they're in Colombia they have uh, percentages for local government, percentages for regional government, and that's paid over for long periods of time to ensure the funding over long periods of time of economic development. So this is recognized in many different ways. In Quebec, it's recognized through royalty payments, uh, giving the, the Cree communities even, uh, they have big construction firms, enabling them to build some of the dams themselves, to sell power to Hydro-Quebec. So there are many different benefit-sharing mechanisms. So that's on a technical level. Um, yeah, I mean, I just have an anecdote to kind of agree with your point. Um, so, yeah, so the, the North Energia invested in 11 municipalities around the region um, in various projects that I mentioned, like building schools and improving roads and sanitation. Um, and in Altamira, they built an entire sanitation system in the city, and they ran all of these ads and billboards about, you know, a lot of a large percentage of, of the north of Brazil does not have sanitation. They just have open sewers. And Alto Mira is going to be one of the first cities with sanitation. So they built this whole system and dug up the roads. And then they didn't connect houses to them. And they said, well, we did all of this. Like, the local government can pay to connect the houses. And the local government says, hey, like, it's not our fault that you're building the dam. And I don't know what actually ended up being resolved. But that's where there was a real lack of communication and involvement and consultation with the local and, and municipal government. Um, so I agree, and yeah. Just an FAA, uh, North oh, yeah. Energy is going to- They're doing it? The oh, good. So they are very behind on the schedule? Yeah. yeah, not surprising. For the Senecas, local government really wasn't, wasn't relevant because of the treaty. So all of the negotiations were with the federal government. Um, the corn planters would have been different because they held their land independently and they had to negotiate independently as homeowners. And it was generally agreed that they received less than, than the people in the Seneca Nation. Um, the the non-Senecas who lived in the, in the white villages, and particularly the city of Salamanca, were very angry. Um, they thought the, the, the Indians were getting way too much. Um, and I don't, I mean, they wanted the highway because they thought that the highway would bring tourist traffic, I mean, this is the whites as well as many of the Indians, um, but what it's actually allowed them to do is bypass the area. Um, now, in, in terms of the local government, Senecas have become much more um, active in the local government, so Senecas have served on the school board, um, they run for sheriff, um, so they're, they're beginning to participate in that local government as well. Um, I ju I'd just like to make a comment on the David and Goliath thing from the perspective of some work I've done on urban development caused uh, resettlement, which doesn't have much of anything to do with dams um, and has to do with primarily with roads uh, and other kinds of urban infrastructure, roads and rail systems and stuff like that. Um, so I was looking particularly at the role of activists in and what they were able to do, uh, kind of looking secondary sources at a variety of places. And the number of times they actually stopped something from being constructed was minimal. I mean, it happened from time to time, but mostly it didn't, because there were all these huge vested interests in having it, having the project go forward. Um, but if you look over a very long period of time, like 20, 30 years, you begin to see in a lot of places real changes 
to um, bulldo the incidence of bulldozing uh, neighborhoods, which goes down. And I think a lot of the and how and the kind of compensation people get and and how, what kind of neighborhoods improvements they get when they need to leave. So I think first of all that in terms of stopping, people haven't been very successful. In terms of getting better compensation, activism has been very important. And it also works to get changes in laws, but it, that happens incrementally through the actions of several different projects over, over time. And as people begin to think differently about what's allowable and what's not allowable. I mean, I would argue that what Vincent was talking about, about the changes in how the World Bank goes about things, is not just because people in the bank kind of oh, woke no, up one morning, <laughs> but it's because of all these <coughs> activists who yeah, have been working. Sure. And researchers. And, yeah, yeah sure. for, mm -hmm. you know, a very long time yeah. on, on getting changes made. So it's very slow, it's very incremental, mm -hmm. but it does occur. Vincent, I had a question for you. I had a question <coughs> for Dolores, that's great. <laughs> okay, actually, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead with your question? No, no, go ahead first. Okay. okay. Um, <clears throat> the, the incremental improvements because of um, the studies, because of activist pressure and changes in policy, so far so good. Do you think the planning that's actually made sitting in boardrooms, to what extent does it actually get implemented at the gra grassroots level? Mm -hmm. And second, often there are vested interests within the various stakeholders involved, uh, from the affected group's leaders mm -hmm. to government officials and departments themselves who have a reason in not pushing certain ideas or, or not taking projects seriously or not even being competent or not even having resources and trying to pass on the buck. Given these situations, even if they're the best of planning being made in offices, to what extent does it translate on the ground? Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> so actually, it's, it's practically related to why I'm working at the World Bank. Um, because I think we're getting the planning right on a lot of these issues. Then the question is the outcomes. And even where I work at the World Bank, We've been focusing a lot on the planning, and you know, and we, we get it. You know, we got there pretty much. Now, what we're focusing on is outcomes, or the lack of attention that's being paid to supervising the implementation of these programs, um, and following up on the outcomes. So that's basically the large part of the focus in my work, my colleagues' work, and it's been translated into new budgeting arrangements, much increased budgets at the bank for supervising. Uh, implementation of environmental social plans, right? And uh, reorganizations, hiring new staff, so it's a whole new focus on this. So yeah, this is definitely something where we have to work a lot more. Uh, the challenge is also uh, is that development banks don't implement these things. It's the countries, right? And then that goes to your second question about capacity, vested interests, uh, do they believe in it? Do they, they sign on to the plans, but do they really want to implement them? So that's a whole long process. And uh, that's related to another focus we have on is evaluating borrower capacity to actually implement these plans that they've committed to. Uh, also focusing a lot more on uh, developing the capacity, putting much more money and effort into training institutions. Um, and eventually maybe becoming a little sharper in terms of suspending projects that are not properly implemented. So I, I'm working now, I've been asked to work on a, at a, a project that's going into implementation called the Kandaji Dam in Niger, a giant dam with lots of resettlement. And there are problems, so the bank has suspended the, the project, conditional to the projects, the problem being fixed. And it's, that's a change of culture also that's been going big question. And your question. Uh, uh, my question for Dolores is, uh, Dolores had a very, very interesting presentation on uh, follow-up on resettlement of the Manantili Dam, and it was focused on Southwest Mali. I just, and she, Dolores knows this, there are also a lot of issues about downstream impacts. 
from the Manantiri Dam in Senegal, along the Senegal River Basin. And there is considerable research that's been done, uh, that was done over a number of years also on the downstream impacts, where there is proposed irrigation development along the Senegal River, and problems associated with that also. Even uh, geopolitical conflicts between Mauritania and Senegal over these things. So there's a lot of interesting literature on the Manantiri Dam. I just wanted to see if you wanted to add to that. Um, no, I kind of try to stay away from <laughs> okay. the downstream. I mean, which, which I shouldn't do, because the downstream impacts actually affect a lot more people. Yeah. Um, and there have been ongoing discussions about uh, creating an artificial flood. So yeah. Part of the issue downstream had to do with the regularization of the river meant, I'll back up a second, the kind of irrigation that was done on the banks of the Senegal River in Mauritania and Senegal was kind of flood recession. The river would rise and then people would plant as the river was going down and, and retain some mm -hmm. the, the humidity. With regularization of the river because of the dam, um, downstream no longer has that up and down, but you can simulate it um, partially by doing an artificial flood at a certain time of the year. And that was there have been ongoing discussions, and to the best of my knowledge, that has never, yeah. that has not really occurred. Um, there have been some issues with actually managing the dam in such a way that it makes money um, through the through the electric. So the dam generates electricity, which gets sold to um, the different countries. Uh, so that people have to rely primarily on pump irrigation. Uh, at, on the Senegal, and I think they're just doing it, but it costs it costs more money it's a very, for the farmers. Very complex program and project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, please. Oh, hi, Julia. Um, so it obviously seems like a fundamental injustice to flood tribal land, and then on top of displacing people, then the tribe just lost 10,000 acres of their land. So I wonder, was there ever, or was it ever an option or on the table? I saw that the land bordered a state park, like to add land outside of the original borders? or They asked for that and they got it in compensation. They got 795 acres as compensation for that group 17. Mm -hmm. um, but no, that was never really on the table. And much of that is, is steep hillsides too. Uh, if you look at the park, there's okay. a few areas that they could have taken. Yeah. Um, but that was really never, well, I think part of the reason that was never really on the table was that it was state land and they were negotiating with the federal government, so the federal government couldn't give them state land. Mm -hmm. But um, um, th there's a couple nice campgrounds there that would have been actually possible to settle, but I, I, I don't recall any attempt to, to do that. And th the Seneca Nation hates New York State. <laughs> I can imagine, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you still work with them? Not as much. I, I go to some of their, I mean, I missed that. Yesterday, the um, native foods dinner that they've been doing, which is another way that they keep things going. The elders will make some traditional foods, and, and they've been doing that ever since mm -hmm. the, the relocation, so that's great. In fact, that reminds me, you had given me an update when we got in touch through email about some new event. The water had level had gone down, they'd gone back to the old place to pray or something? Oh, when, the, <coughs> when, when I went through it this weekend, it, the, the water is, is incredibly low. Yeah. Um, and so you can see some of the old homesteads. Oh, and wow. yeah, which is really heartbreaking for the, for the people who, um, you know, it's, it's when it's their land. Um, yeah. Vincent, thanks again. No, oh, we're sorry that yeah, that you have to leave us, but thanks again. <clears throat> Please give me a call in case there's any problem. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I can't can't remember specifically what you're referring to. I'm sorry. The, the email you said the water level. Yeah, they could see the homestead and they had gone back. Yeah, to have a look and, and yeah. yeah, yeah. And they, you know, they've been doing that ever since. I mean, the, the tie to go back down there is is really strong, um, and a lot of non non Indians sometimes go down there and camp, which just you know infuriates the Senecas, and they will they will go and try and throw them out. 
And then there's also some tension between those people who have land that when the water level is low, their traditional land is there. But you know, so yours might be there, but mine's not. So oh, you can right. so you could rent your land to 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 a, to a white person and get money from it, even though you've been compensated for it. And I'm up here and I can't. So there's you know it has created some tension among people. But to get back to your local um, government question, one of the things is if you'll recall, the Cataraugus Reservation didn't lose any land. And yet the rehabilitation fund was paid to the entire Seneca Nation. And so what they did was the same facilities that were built at Allegheny was built at the other reservation. So both reservations actually in terms of infrastructure really benefited from that. And some of the Senecas at Allegheny were angry then. They said, well, you know, we're the ones who gave up our land and yet you get the same swimming pool that we did. And on the other hand, some people at Cataraugus would say, well, you know, you guys didn't fight hard enough. That's why you lost. So it's, it's been a source of, of some tension, but it's really been fairly mild. Yes. Uh, Sophia? Yes. <laughs> I'm pretty floppy. That's OK. We're still recording. So that's the reason. There's no other. It has good acoustics. Hello. Um, I'm wondering if any of these projects ever try to employ the local people, like to give them jobs temporarily as a mode of compensation, or is that not, does that not ever happen? Um, so in m the Bellamonte project, um, among the rural displaced people there, they could have worked for the dam building company. Only a small handful actually did. Um, there were some people that kind of commuted and worked on in, on the construction, and there were some others who worked as kind of bus drivers, bringing employers from the city to the dam building site, but um, but not many. So they had the option, but I think few people kind of wanted to do that uh, versus staying in farming, um, at least among the rural population. Um, at Monon at Monontale, when they were rebuilding the this for the resettlement project. When they were rebuilding the houses, they had um, kind of professional, cons they were like traditional houses, but they had hired construction companies to do it. And, and those mostly didn't have local people working for them. But then they couldn't figure out, um, I had a slide that had, they had these thatched conical roofs and um, I can find this. Yeah. Quickly. There it is. Uh, let me do that. Where's um, it? Just go to, yeah. Uh, up here. Yes. Okay, so. Somewhere. Yeah. So they, they, they had these thatched conical roofs on the houses. And nobody, nobody from the city knew how to make them. So young men were hired to do that. Um, the young men were also hired. That's it. But I mean, the young men were also hired by the resettlement project to do the clearing of of the areas uh, that were going to be given out as as fields. So they were hired. Few people worked for the dam, um, and but it was very very patchy and erratic. But we talked to people who had worked for the dam and been in accidents and then got insurance payments for the rest of their life because of uh, they were partially disabled. Um, and a number of them earned, learned metal working somehow in conjunction with either the dam or for putting in the power lines later and um, then were able to do that as independent entrepreneurs afterwards. But that was, that was much spottier. The Senecas actually hired not for work with the dam, but all the new communities that were built were built by Seneca Construction Companies. Um, and so they were, they were using it as a teaching for, for young men to, on, you know, how to build. So it, it did employ people to that extent.
Yeah. It was very interesting to see that they built traditional houses, and I, I, I'm wondering how they got to that design. How did they decide to keep on the traditional way of living? Because in most of the large dam um, resettlement process, what you see is a completely different typology of houses that is built more like a cook cutter. Uh, style that, that happened in the, in the resettlements in Altamira and in many other places. How many people, can you remind us how many people were displaced and uh, how did they get? A thousand. And 44 villages and hamlets. Yeah, like Altamira we are talking about, the new resettlements um, involve 4,000, but they are completely different houses. Um, so I think, you know, there's a lot of, lot of examples and I can't think of any off the top of my head where particularly in rural areas, these new settlements were, were built. People didn't know how to live in them, essentially. And the houses just kind of went to ruin, and they were abandoned, and, and so on. And it was because of that that it was decided um, to basically reconstruct the villages as they were, which is not in a grid, which is, it looks random. Uh, it's probably not uh, different. Uh, households vis-a-vis -vis each other and then each household just grows with every adult has their own house and you add an adult to the household you add a house um, and they're round and they're about 12 or 13 feet in diameter um, they were improved in the sense that each one was given a cement flooring and um, they had been constructed with wattle and daub, but instead they used adobe bricks that were reinforced with cement to build the walls. So that, that they're bricks, and then, and then some of them were plastered on the outside and, and, and some of them weren't, but they kept the, the conical roofs that, that they were used to. Now, there was a lot of criticism. I think that was a success. I think that was a good choice, and I think that it was successful over the short term. There was a lot of criticism of it right after the resettlement because Montanelli became this place that like local bureaucrats went, national bureaucrats. Oh, they would get taken out to see this kind of national achievement of Montanelli Dam, and they would say, "Why did you put these people in?" Why didn't you give them new houses? Why didn't you put them, allow them the privilege of living in streets on grids, um, and and so on? And there was a lot of debate about that. Uh, interestingly, we went back, like, this year, and several villages said, "Why didn't you put us in grids? Why didn't you? Why didn't you put us in um, houses like that?" Uh, so here we are, here we have these like mud houses. Um, so, but I think that's, I actually think for a lot of people that's a reinterpretation of the past. Because even the cement floors, people weren't used to. So one of the first things they did is they moved into the house and they dug a hole in, in the middle of the house so they could put a fire there. Um, in the in the cold season, and, and and people could warm up because the cement flat cement floor meant that they lost this traditional central hearth of of the house. Um, so I think you know, not everybody's whatever choice you make, not everybody's going to agree with it. I think I'll quickly add to that. I recall, I mean, uh, for the last 16 years, first two years as a grassroots activist and thereafter as an academic, I've been studying um, Sardar Sarovar Dam resettlement. This is on Narmada River in Western India. This was the f one of the, f this was the first project where World Bank had to withdraw midway. It was partially funding the, the project. It was the first time it instituted um, an inquiry commission. Anyway, the interesting thing is, it was, it's pretty decent resettlement, although the activists disagree. Now, the thing is, the government planners, they made grid light structures and, and brought these people. They even made arrangement for having toilets every, for every second house. But these, these hill communities, I mean, they had been moved to the plains. They were used to going to the sides of the hill for defecating. 
So what happened to all those toilets? Some of them are used for storing fodder. Others have gone to disuse. Yet others, um, so this is how it is. So it's one thing to sit and plan, but the moment you go down at the people's levels, their interpretation and approach is totally different. So. Uh, w what I saw in Altamira and many other places is, is that we, you know, developers constructed the house, but then the community reshaped the house in the previous style, like they invest a lot in verandas, for example, in the Amazon, because that's where they cook and they, they meet their families. So m most of the improvements and the money that they invest in the house in the first place is in building the external environment of the house walls sometimes because uh, those neighborhoods became uh, more dangerous, more violent. So th there might be a very interesting comparative research to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I'd, I'd also like to uh, make a little comment that I think there are very different constraints about rural and urban resettlement in terms of housing. Um, uh, that a lot of housing in urban areas uh, either needs to be put into relative, I mean, you have this choice of sending people out to the periphery, which they don't like because they're far away from, we talked about that, mm -hmm. they're far away from their jobs, from their social networks or everything. Or if you try to find land more centrally located, um, you have to build up, which they're not used to. So. If, and, and getting land um, that's not ridiculously priced in big cities is, is very difficult. Uh, so that I, I don't, I mean, there's ways to do urban resettlement better, but I don't think there's necessarily a lot of choice. Those, those houses, by the way, look exactly like houses in I'm South sure, Africa yeah. that I've seen yep. in housing projects. Yeah, they weren't done yet in that picture, but then they painted like every third one a different pastel color and yeah. probably the same. They are probably the same with the colors. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's the relational to our photography that we just researched earlier. So. Yep. I had a question for all three of you. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start with an anecdote. Um, the community that I studied, they were not used to dealing with cash on a regular basis. Uh, I mean, as all of you have pointed out, and we all are aware, the last three or four decades, three decades in particular, have seen such dramatic transformation in, in rural settings in places in Asia, Africa, and Latin America. And even in the U.S., as you pointed, I mean, as uh, <clears throat> Vincent was pointing out in his study of Quebec, the kind is almost as if people were frozen in time, which is not correct, which is not correct. But almost like in the last three, four decades, market, money, technology has percolated so dramatically. So what happens is, and in rural settings, for example, in South Asia, where I work on, even the richest of farmers were not used to dealing with cash because they get cash twice a year when they sell their produce, and, and that usually is tied up through the, you know, through the local merchants and everything. So they don't handle cash. So when cash compensation comes because of these resettlement projects, I have such fantastic and, and sad stories of people how they blew their money in six months, eight months, on lavish weddings, um, buying expensive vehicles, I mean money which they was given in lieu of having lost all the land and everything which they could have invested wisely, except that they, were, they didn't, they didn't they, I mean, that's a question of e economic anthropology. They didn't know how to deal with money, and they just blew it. And they were on the roads. And this, no, you can't blame anyone, because the planners gave them the money. The people didn't know how to handle money, and it was all gone. I was just wondering, what was the experience in each of the three settings that you saw in terms of compensation and, 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 and how it was used in terms of pragmatic planning or, or wasteful use here? There weren't many reports of people blowing it, um, but a lot of people ran into problems because the things that they had used, they were used to getting for free. 
you know, their, their fire would heat their house, so they got the water from the river. Mm -hmm. what, was, what was disconcerting to them and they had a problem dealing with was the weekly or the monthly bills that came in, and, and that was really a hardship, not so much because they had, you know, used the money for other things, but just they were paying for things that they never had to pay for before, and they had to pay, you know, at a certain time, at a certain place, and, and things like that. So it was, that certainly was a, was a problem for them. Uh, why not, you know, I was really so interested. There's, there's a real debate on this issue in, in the resettlement literature versus giving people land. So you lose your land. Do you give land or do you, do you give compensation? And kind of the religion of the resettlement planners has been land should be replacement land. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't, precisely for these reasons, you shouldn't give people money. But you put, you yeah. recount a very successful. I had a very opposite experience. And, you know, the people, this is now. So this is not in the 60s. This is not, you know, a population that's. Um, disconnected from urban areas, from the world. So uh, people, you know, although almost half of them had no electricity, they had some, many had generators that, so they could have a TV or plug in their phones for when they went to the city and got service. And, um, you know, some had motorcycles to get around and they were accustomed to going in, you know, selling their cacao or selling their crops at the market. Um, so cash in general wasn't an issue cash as far as compensation also wasn't an issue as you know as i showed you i can think of one story where the guy blew his cash and everyone else made like really kind of responsible investments and it really gave um the land owning households like you know we trust you it gave them the opportunity to make their own decisions and investments the people who didn't own land got a credit payment and the way it worked was that they could, they were only supposed to use it for titled, documented land, which was like not all properties were titled, it was, and they tended to be a little more expensive. And the dam building company would then pay the landowner directly, and if there was some money left over, you would like get it in parcels. And so not only was it a low amount of compensation, but they were not free to use it how they wanted. And I'm sure that was because, you know, thinking that people who didn't own land couldn't manage the money well. Um, but a lot of people said, you know, I wish they had just gave us the money so that we could be more flexible with how we use it instead of, you know, having these restrictions that they put on it. So, so that was my experience, that it actually, like, the cash and the freedom that came with it worked really well in this context. I mean, at Monantelli, people got land, and they got extra compensation for other things which they then, a lot of them used it to get married. But I'm, I would argue that that's actually an investment uh, and not, I mean, if you don't have any land, then you, you, you're, you're in trouble. But, you know, if, you're, if you use it in addition rather than a so-called productive investment, you're, you're investing in labor and you're investing in you know, the future of your household. It's been a um, I, have a, I have a question for both of you. Did you find in any cases where um, the people to be relocated divided up their land before relocation to make sure that other people got land? So like what, what happened with the Senecas was a lot of people, if they had just an old outbuilding or something, they would have a friend move into that and then claim it as a house so that person would be able, would be eligible for a relocation <coughs> house. A lot of people sold land, you know, with just a handshake, no exchange of money, to make sure that people who wouldn't be eligible would be eligible. I mean, there's really, they, they would have gotten more money for it, but it was, there was really this communal attempt to, to make sure that people who didn't have land or who were renters could, could somehow be incorporated at, at a better level. In, so in my case, people who didn't have land were always living on someone else's land, whether they were sharecroppers or whether they were the son of the landowner and either sometimes lived in the very same house but often, you know, had another house on the property. And they were all compensated with the credit payment. So, like, kind mm -hmm. of, it, uh, you know, th they did benefit 
in their own way if they were, um, you know, I guess not considered part of the household or even, um, even some kind of young, like older adolescent boys who were like who I stayed with who were still living with their parents got compensated, got credit payments, but probably if it was a girl they wouldn't have, you know. Mm -hmm. So, but they they did receive money. Well, in Monticelli, they didn't own their land because. Nobody owned, nobody owned their <coughs> land, but so there. But there was this complicated thing about uh, people would farm together as big extended households, and that would be reflected in this thing called the carnet family carnet, which is the tax record uh, for the family, which lists all the members of the family. And one of the things people did before resettlement was to divide up was to separate the household into different households, each of which was enumerated separately. I'm not, given that land, the amount of replacement land you got depended on the number of people you had and not how much land you farmed before, I'm not sure that made any difference except that it gave you different allocations in different places, uh, which gave you perhaps more flexibility. I have about three questions. I'm going to start with one that's a very basic one, but um, I think Vincent had started with the question of why hydropower. And I'm just wondering um, if uh, anyone can answer this question, why there's still reliance on dams for electrical power. And for um, Heather specifically, you mentioned the Amazon settlement project. I just wanted to know who was allowed to settle in such areas. Um, for example, was this specifically done for the indigenous groups, or was it for anyone who would like to settle. And also, were there cases of corruption when it came to uh, relocation, uh, compensation for relocation? And um, also, was the land similar, or were the areas where people resettled, were they similar to the original um, lands that they inhabited? And I guess just for some context, we're studying Egypt, so um, I'm trying to compare, and in the case of the high dam, uh, or in the case of Egypt in general, just the fact that there's so much desert land, and if we look at some of the more modern projects or the more recent projects, it just doesn't make sense. Um, because in such cases, they, if you go out into the desert, for example, then a very few, if any, people would be affected. And um, when it comes to uh, compensation, we had issues with, with uh, the areas um, and if you compare, like, where people were taken, that were they, the areas where they inhabited originally, there was a big uh, difference in Well, Vince, Vincent would have. Yeah. <laughs> I know he would have been the hydro, better person. Um, I mean, because you make this big investment, and then it's free. I mean, it's a lot of money to build a dam, but then the, the water just as long as the water keeps coming, the water keeps coming, and essentially that investment amortizes itself over a very long number of years. And before people started talking about the methane that was being produced by reser the, these large bodies of water sitting there, um, hydro was seen as a renewable resource. So that's, that, that's, and people weren't also talking about the environmental destruction that happens downstream, but in the sense that it's, it's not taking a fossil fuel out of the mm -hmm. ground that can't be replenished. It's, but comparing cleaner. solar and wind, um, in the case of the Brazilian dam, this was just very recent. Right? Yeah. I mean, Brazil just has a lot of hydropower potential. There's mm -hmm. a lot of rivers, mm -hmm. um, and there's still a lot of area to be dammed. Um, and, and they also, I mean, in their energy expansion government plans, like, it includes, you know, these other sources of, of energy. And, yeah, I don't have a good reason... Um, Maybe you do. Why? Why Brazil I think just loves dams? I think to understand the Brazilian case, that we needed to look beyond energy. I think we have to look at the mining, uh, agribusiness, and energy complex because they are often coupled. Mm -hmm. So you do have the production of energy that's feeding uh, the central, south, and metropolitan areas in Brazil for sure. But they are also opening land for 
mining. They are also opening land for agribusiness. And beyond that, in the case of the Xingu River and the Tapajós River, which is the next frontier, um, you are uh, aligning the river for waterways to transport crops. So you needed to look at this developmental uh, politi political agenda that goes beyond. That's why my question about regional and local governments being empowered and strengthened to counterclaim the national development <coughs> projects. Because to understand this dynamic, you really needed to understand the, the national and even the global dynamic. Ala, to give you a quick answer, I think I have three points to add. The first one is <clears throat> every era has its politically correct stance. So um, right now, in today's times, I think the chances that if somebody is from an indigenous community, is from a minority group, from a, a remote ethnic group, the chances that if they are persecuted, it'll get attention is way higher than people who may, much bigger in size in numerical numbers, but it'll not get the attention. So, and 30 years, 40 years back, as Joy's case shows, it was the exact opposite. It was exact. I mean, if you compare Belamonte to um, the Allegheny case, it's the exact opposite. So there, those people didn't matter. If it is a bunch of white people living there, nobody would have touched them. Here, entire treaties were broken, Supreme Court, President, everybody, it, these people were cheated. Compare that to Belomonte, Sting lands up. I mean, in my same case, I mean, in my here, I mean, the, there was a much bigger population getting displaced in the plains. Nobody came, but you had film stars, rock stars, everybody landing up in Narmada because there was a hill community. So it was, anyway. So that's, so there's the politically correct uh, stance. So the, what, what's politically incorrect these days for about a decade are dams in general. It's just that. However, if you move to the second aspect, which is if I can talk about, say, Indian subcontinent, even parts of Africa and, and the US, where you have in Indian subcontinent, the entire population is limited to two months of monsoon. And you have five month long summers, which are really harsh. The only water body that can actually store water are large dams. Medium dams cannot do it, small dams. Though are the, that's when you need water most. It's really horrific. So similarly, I mean, California has been seeing drought for the last three, four years. So dams are one way of, they, this is not the only solution, but it's one way of, uh, I'm sorry, I'm almost standing and defending on behalf of Vincent. <laughs> but they are one way of, um, um, I realized, I mean, I, that was my transition from opposing to um, realizing. That's one of the ways that we cannot get to it. Because of the sheer size of population, the kind of technology, lifestyle that we are all living and expecting, there is no other way to sustain it. And the third and the final point is, as all these projects have shown, between creation of a technology, actually planning it, selecting a site and implementing it, the gestation period is huge. We're talking of decades. So, uh, I mean, in case of um, Manatali Dam, the dam was complete. They didn't have money to set up a power point, uh, the power plant. It's set up, the people still haven't got the electric supply. Soon they'll get it. It's the same with Belamonte Dam. It's been planned for decades, and even now it's, it's still. So the point is, the recent developments, I recall in 2002 when I asked a few experts, why aren't we using solar energy? They said, oh, we don't have such efficient uh, machines. But then technology has improved. But in terms of wind and solar, we are they're still cutting edge technology, but the prices still have to come down to such an extent that they can be exploited easily. The bottom line is there is no clean energy as such. Every kind of resource that we consume will have a drawback to it. Nuclear energy was seen as clean till Fukushima and Cher Chernobyl has shaken things. But who, what can sustain this lifestyle? I mean, that's a question we have to ask ourselves. Um, so you had a couple of other questions. I'll just answer quickly. Um, so the Amazon settlement scheme was um, not involving indigenous populations. Its explicit purpose was resettle was to resettle people from other parts of Brazil. Um, so the northeast of Brazil um, is a very drought prone, dry region. So um, far, you know, landless people from the northeast in particular who lived in kind of really harsh uh, environments, and also kind of smallholder farmers from southern Brazil into the Amazon. So people um, were provided with free transportation, 
a hundred hectare plot of land, um, a house that they could pay back in installments, all kind of to move into this area. So what was the government's motivation for doing this? So their explicit motivation was um, to provide land to landless people, um, and there was a lot of land, but you know, there's other kind of more geopolitical motivations of having control, like this in vast interior of the country where there was almost no one aside for indigenous populations, um, so to kind of expand the population into um, the rest of the country and have more control over that region, for example. Um, so the land, uh, the land in the original area was um, really good for cacao production, which is a particular type of soil that, um, that you can grow cacao on. And um, it's quite lucrative. So farmers could actually make you know, a, a decent living selling cacao. Um, and really, so the, the land that people moved to varied on kind of two different planes, like the soil quality, whether it was good for cacao or kind of worse soil had to be used for pasture. Um, how many cacao trees were already on the land because they take multiple years to reach maturity and start producing. Um, so you, a lot of people wanted to find land that already had a bunch of cacao trees that were producing so they could start making income right away. Um, not everyone, some people actually wanted to f uh, have cattle because it's kind of less of a day-to-day -day investment. Um, you just let them graze. Um, and then the other dimension is the distance and where the land was. So where, how, how far down a terrible quality dirt road were, did you have to go to get to your land? How far was it from Alto Mira, from the other cities? Um, and those, you know, those determined the price of the land. And so people who got low amounts of compensation ended up on land that was far away or land that had, you know, very few cacao trees, stuff like that. Any last questions? We still have a couple of minutes. In case any of you wanted to compare the situation with what you've read about um, the dam in Egypt, it's Aswan, right? I mean, that was, you, that's been part of the reading, or yours? Uh, we're getting there. OK, OK, <laughs> OK. I think it's 7 o'clock. It's been a really long session. I think I should um, thank and also spare my speakers any further uh, <laughs> trouble. Thanks again. Um, I must say that um, because of uh, logistical constraints, um, all the speakers, including Vincent, were contacted at the last moment. We were really worried, but then all of you agreed to not only come, you came, but you all had presentations. Like we said, we want these, these, these topics covered. Yes, it'll be all be done. Thank you very much for coming. And thank you for your wonderful papers. Um, the listeners included students who are part of my class on displacement, and, and they all learned a lot. Thanks again, and um, yes. <laughs>